you, can you hear me all right? Have I come out? Excellent. Well, good evening. My name is Vaughan Smith. I'm moderating tonight. Um, and I'll introduce the panel. Um, uh, we, as we, as we, we know, we're going to start with about a... About, can you hear me all right there? Yeah. About a 30-minute discussion. Um, we'll talk a little bit about an outfit called Warm. And then we'll talk about how uh, the coverage of conflicts has changed uh, over the period of time that we've all been in, in the news industry. And then we're going to talk about Syria for a bit and watch a film. At the end of the film, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so, and the film's uh, 50 minutes or so, something like that. OK, so I'm going to introduce our, our, our panel. Um, from the left, um, we've got Patrick Chaval. We all know each other um, uh, pretty well, uh, our, our old news hands. We've all covered the stories and been there. And, um, and, and Patrick is he's an Anglophile, extraordinarily, so he's very welcome here. Um, I sort of learn. Um, he's got a history here that he no doubt will tell you all about. Um, uh, he uh, is an independent photojournalist, or was, covered the Six-Day War, Vietnam, um, and um, has that sort of depth of experience and length in the trade. Turned in, moved to video, been shot, been everywhere, um, and so, you know, good chap and all of that. Then we've got Remy Audin. Um, and as I say, any mispronunciations in any language, uh, uh, forgive me for. Um, uh, war correspondent, Le Monde, so newspaper journalist. Um, we all met in, in Bosnia ages ago, which was, I think, your first conflict, wasn't it, at Bosnia? Um, and um, uh, is now deputy editor, your deputy editor, or you've been further promoted to greatness. Um, um, and um, is really. Uh, I, be, I believe fairly described as the uh, originator of the warm idea. I think is that you claim that, or do you share it? I think you claim that reasonably. <laughs> uh, Sharif uh, Kiwan, um, who um, is a producer um, for Abu Dinar, Abu, uh, Abu Nadara. Have I pronounced it right? Abu Nadara Films, um, which is uh, incredibly interesting, and you're going to see one of their films. Um, effectively, what they do is they anonymously put films out of Syria uh, to avoid censorship. So it's quite an interesting, a very interesting initiative, um, and we'll learn more about that tonight. Um, Paul Lowe's closest to me. Again, photographer. You've been a photographer most of the time, but you're, you're now a lecturer um, uh, at uh, London College of Communication. Is that That's correct? correct yeah. um, and so uh, moved to teaching um, on the whole range of photography um, that we would use for, for news gathering and everything from journalistic ethics to, through to everything. And, and again, Bosnia and Chechnya, all these places. So an experience panel for you today. Um, I'm going to start, um, if I can, um, asking, uh, uh, if, I, if I may, uh, uh, Remy, could you explain an outline of what the WARM project is and what it is you want us to understand about WARM? What is WARM? So WARM is about... Um Two things ma mainly. It's about uh, gathering people all together, about reporters, artists, historians being together to work on, on conflicts, all the world conflicts. It's an mm. international project. And, um, and it's about having uh, a center which will be based in Sarajevo in the future when we find the money. Uh, uh, which is both about, which is both an archive center, and a production center to help people produce, you know, films, uh, books, exhibitions, whatever. We got the idea when we gathered in Sarajevo for the 20th anniversary of the war in Bosnia. Uh, this was a, a journalist gathering. By the way, we never go back to stories, um, and this was the one story that we all oddly went back to, and we all saw each other again back in Sarajevo. It was obviously an important story for us all. Yeah. So f yeah, uh, so we were like hundreds and hundreds, you know, and uh, I was there a few weeks before to help, you know, our friends from Sarajevo to organize it, and uh, that's how we got the idea about WARM, because it doesn't exist. We all love, you know, the Frontline Club projects about film, about mm. photography, about Vietnam, about Bosnia, mm. about whatever, but there is no project about all conflicts and about, you know, all, uh, you know bringing together reporters, artists, different people. Mm. So that's how we got the idea with our friends from Sarajevo, who are mostly artists, and uh, you know, Paul is working a lot with them also, uh, activists yeah. about the war memories. And, um, and then when we, we talked about it in a small room uh, yeah. during this with Patrick, Van, a few mm. people, John Jones, Gary Knight, uh, and then we started WARM. Um, 
we are doing our first festival at the end of June, if anyone wants to come to Sarajevo. Where will, oh, it's in Sarajevo, the festival. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, um, and we hope to have that warm center in 2016, you know, 17. Pa pa Patrick, what will the warm center actually do? Well, the warm center is like when we have the money. That's what it, <laughs> you know, that's the idea. It's to find the money yeah. to organize expos and help young or older, I hope, uh, photographers, reporters, filmmakers, yeah. to go on with long projects. The main idea is that we just don't want the, the, the stories to stay in the news, only in the news, one war, and then it's not the news anymore, and, uh, and one war chases another yeah. war, and for, you forget about the war before. Yeah. There, people are going to be able to find, to look at, and to transmit uh, the information all year round. Yeah. And with the money of the people coming in the expos and things like that. Is this geared at freelancers mainly, or is it more broad? I think it's broad. It's everybody. It's anybody. It's everybody. Everybody, yeah. anybody who has talent. Paul, you why know? are you interested in it? Why are you supporting it? Uh, well, you know, I. I live in I partly live in Sarajevo, so I've got a vested interest there. But I'm also very interested in education and archives, and obviously a lot of the questions, the research, the kind of ethical questions, for example, around the way yeah. we cover conflict these days. So there's a whole range of, of really quite important yeah. and quite difficult topics that we want to try and engage with, and give a kind of critical perspective on some of that, and not mm -hmm. just within journalism, but also looking at the world of culture, and art, and in general the representation of conflict, both contemporary conflicts but also historical ones as well. Yeah. And obviously Sarajevo as a city has a unique character because of its role in the 20th century, yeah. but also because it's a mix of different cultures, it's a, mm. meet, it's a melting pot, different religions and so on. And we also felt it was probably the one city in the world where kind of everybody could sort of agree to go to. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it, you know, although there are, there are, there are, there are mm. sides there as well, we really felt it was a kind of symbol. And I think the way that all the journalists came, as you said, you know, we haven't had a 20 years of Kabul or uh, 20 years of Baghdad, yeah, whatever yeah. it might be. It was something about that place that kind of captured people's imagination, people's soul, I think. A lot of journalists, as you said, um, cut their mm. teeth there. It was, it was mm. kind of the gen our generation's um, mm. conflict. I mean, we've got very strong and fond memories there and good connections. And also, you know, it's well-connected. It's in Europe. Uh, it's actually quite a good place because it's very easy, for example, for people from like, countries like Syria to get visas because it's actually not in the Schengen. Oh, that's so, an important point. So yeah. it's actually got this ability to kind of act as a cultural sort of um, mm. boundary space, if mm. you like. Mm. So, yeah. You know, we, since we started, we have, I mean, we work with the most famous university in the world, you know. I mean, well, people are get, really getting interested into work. Who, sorry, you but also with... with the, which university are you working with, sorry? With universities like... Oh, universities, okay. I'm sorry. London, Paris, you know, in yeah, the yeah, US yeah. and so on. Yeah. Uh, museums, mm -hmm. you know, and so on. But we also get, you know, long, long letters from a Somali rock band or an Iraqi rap yeah, yeah, yeah. group or, you know, whatever. And um, it's really interesting to mix all these people together. That's what yeah. we will try to do at, with this first festival at the end of June. So, so it's got a fair it's amount of art. It's a small festival. It, yeah. It's quite artistic then, isn't it, as well as journalism. I mean, I think during yeah. the war, Sarajevo, one of the really interesting things about it was the way that the citizens resisted the conflict, not just through by going to the front lines, but it was by things like art yeah, and culture yeah. and music. Okay. So it's broader. Reform. It's quite broad, isn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and that, that heritage has sort of carried on, and so it's very much a cultural center. Uh, there's a lot yeah. of still film production going on there. There's a very successful film festival. Yeah. So we're building on that kind of, in a way, yeah. Sarajevo is a kind of festival city in some ways. Mm -hmm. And the festival this yeah. year, uh, it's not going to be quite as, as grand as we'd hoped because of the funding, but we're going to have some really interesting exhibitions. We've got a uh, tribute to Chris Hondros, who, as many people know, mm -hmm. was killed in Liberia. Uh, we have a very great new show Libya. about Grozny. Libya. Libya, sorry, not Liberia, it's a for that. Uh, we've got a lot of films, including the, the Syrian film from here, a yeah. season documentary films. Uh, we're going to have a one-day yeah. conference that's going to involve people coming from, from Europe, um, curators yeah. from museums, galleries, historians, and so on, to talk about the, the sort of issues around uh, media and conflict, photography yeah. as well. Um, and then we're going to have a one-day kind of brainstorming event for WARM itself, okay. where we're bringing people, the people who are attending the conference are going to help us yeah. plan the future, think about how, what kind of archive we, do yeah. we need to build, what kind of questions should we be engaging yeah. with, and so on. And the idea is that the festival will then become an annual event at the end of June, beginning of July every year, because that's the, obviously around the time of the 100th anniversary of, of the, the assassination of Archie Fan. 
So it's a long-term project. Extremely interesting. You know, and every year, hopefully, it will grow and it will well, build and get bigger I mean, and bigger. I mean, certainly, the, the Frontline Club is uh, in support here and mm -hmm. partnering with you, um, for and very good reasons. So we're convinced. So, um, but Sharif, could you tell us a little bit more about Abu Abu Nara Danara, and pronounce it properly for me, and and explain what it is about as Just well. One word oh, yeah, yeah. before Sharif talks. Yeah. When we. When we went back to our cities after this 20th anniversary, yeah. when we came back to Paris, London, and everywhere, Abu Nadara was the first one project out of sorry, I mean, it's, uh, it's not our project. They, they, yeah, you but know, they existed for years. You're supporting it, uh, but you know, yeah. partnership, uh, supporting, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so on. And uh, because the first two projects were like Bosnian local, yeah. and Abu Nadara was the first foreign. Okay. Project out of Bosnia. So, so, so clearly, there's a there's a big mentoring process that mm -hmm. you're and, trying to and achieve. And I think Abu Nadara is exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, it, I mean, Sharif will explain. It's not. It's they are not reporters. They are not, but it's exactly what what we will support reporters. We will support artists. Yeah. We will support you know historians. Abu Nadara is something really amazing that yeah. it's totally warm spirit. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is we don't want to hear any more people say. We didn't know. <laughs> People used to say that, especially in 1944. Yeah. Uh, I think they today still say you can today. say, yeah. with projects like that, <coughs> and Frontline, and people doing what they're doing in Syria, yeah. you can say, I didn't want to know. But then you're responsible for what you don't know. So basically, it's to have a. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later. So okay. I'm going to hold that. Can I bring you up to finish that off afterwards? I just want the audience to un have an understanding of what, what you do and why it's important and what it is, and then we're going to move on to talk about that. Uh, I am a representative or spokesman, producer also, uh, 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 to a group of filmmakers uh, who are working in Syria. We start to, before uh, the revolution, we wanted to to give a sort of counter information using the cinema aesthetics. Uh, the main idea uh, was that if, if we want uh, people around the world to, to see our society, we have to, to build our own image our own temporality because uh, media, mainstream media uh, failed, did not uh, represent our society uh, accurately or with dignity. So our idea was to use the tools of cinema, the aesthetics of cinema to, to tell the story of our society using internet to diffuse, to broadcast uh, uh, our films and um, try to, to free ourselves uh, from the, the media image of our society. That, that's fantastic and, and extremely interesting and leads on to our conversation. But um, the films you do, I mean, how, how, what kind of, how many do you, films do you put on and, and, and how do you, you know, you make their anonymous, is that, that's right? Isn't yes, it? every Friday we, we release a short, very short film documentary on internet, uh, one to five minutes. Uh, we are all volunteers, all anonymous. Our films are uh, signed by Abu Nadara which means uh, man with glasses. Uh, it's, uh, and every Friday without, without any funding, without any, uh, uh, we just have a strong desire to, to build a new image of our society. Do you know how, how many films by now? Uh, so 160 maybe. Wow. That's a lot of films. Well, I don't think we've all seen those films. Some of us may have. So you're gonna have, we're all going to search for them. And we won't mainly watch all of them, but we're going to have a crack. Um, this is brilliant. Um, but look, let's lead on to the next part of the conversation, if we can. Um, um, and I must check Let the time. Just please oh, go on, then. Yeah, it's all right. That we, uh, we made this feature film with, uh, with our shorts. 
So the film uh, that we'll see <coughs> uh, was made with our short films. Well, that, that's brilliant. That's a good context. So thank you for introducing the film, which we'll see. But now I'd like to talk about, uh, you've led us into this idea that you feel clearly strongly, strongly enough to, to, to do all this work that you're doing, that your country isn't being represented properly by the mainstream media, um, here, for example. Um, and I, that's a pretty good place for us to start, um, I think. Um, and I think I want to tie it into um, uh, your point, Patrick, that you know uh, the public no longer have the right to say they didn't know, they just ignored it. Um, because you know, one wonders whether they're really terribly interested in what we, you know in the job that we do or the content that we deliver very often. Um, can you start us off by commenting on this idea that, okay, we, you know, you're claiming we've done our job, but if they're not interested, why are we risking our lives? Well, first of all, I'm not there to entertain the public. I'm there to give them some information of what's happening around them. Mm. But they don't care. So well, we why are you doing it? Well, we have to make them care. And maybe yeah. one way is to have the Syrians making their own films and it's on the internet, by all means we have to make them care and warm because mm. they can go. Mm. And if somebody would tell me I didn't hear about this story, I didn't see his films, mm. go to warm or go on the seat of warm, the commodity seat on the website. On the website of warm and yeah. check it out. And if you don't check it out, well, you're, you're a fool, you're an idiot because the war is going to come one day at your, your doorstep and you'll have a stupid face. You know, so you have to check out things. It's only one world. I mean, not only for good things and movie stars. It's also so we're not failing. Movie. They're failing. The audience, they're failing. Well, we're, we're in good shape, aren't we? We're, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing we're, the job right. right. I mean, I'm not <laughs> sure it's necessarily the audience even that's failing. I think it's very often it's the, it's the misfit between the narratives that are being put out by the journalistic community and the narratives that are being put out by governments. Because governments have a whole set of interests that don't necessarily and a massive follow. PR machine as well, absolutely and massively and, and better funded than than yeah, our trade. So totally. the assumption that a government <laughs> is essentially a benign organisation that wants the greater good of, of humanity is is obviously pretty flawed. And I think we very much saw that in Bosnia, where sure. you know there was a, a very powerful narrative coming from almost the entire journalistic core. I would say that there were bad guys and good guys in this. Okay, so some bad guys were worse than others, and some good guys were slightly bad as well. But over, overall, the situation was that there was you know, uh, a clear aggressor against a clear victim. But the narrative that came out of, of, of London and Paris and Washington was, no, no, it's the old en en ancient ethnic hatreds, etc. We don't want to get all that. And so because there was that misfit between what the journalistic call was saying and obviously the, the governments, it's only when situations reach such a kind of either because of a, and quite often a spectacular media mm. event as happened with, with Srebrenica and, and some of the marketplace massacres in Bosnia, etc. When the government is kind of forced into action because it, it goes beyond a certain sort of tipping mm. point, it can no longer pretend that, that, that it can't get involved. So I think, if, but if the journalist coverage isn't there to, to kind of build that argument, to, to provide the evidence that, that all, all sorts of different stakeholders can, can engage with, then we're, we're failing society. And I think that social role of what we do is very, very important. And we mustn't yeah. lose it. Uh, thanks for that, Paul. I'm going to follow that up. Remy, you're a bit of a cheese in Le Monde. You're a deputy editor and all that. How do you see, uh, compare war journalism today, covering conflicts and informing the public with when you started? How's it changed? I'm not looking for the technology necessarily. I'm just looking for how you put, you know, uh, is your newspaper informing the public like you it would have when you were a young reporter in Bosnia? Exactly the same. It exactly the same. It didn't change. So, no, I think... Is that typical what, what, or is that what, just that Le Monde I is think, obviously I wonderful? I think Le Monde, you know what I do for Le Monde, yeah. you know, it didn't change. Yeah. Uh, at all. I'm so what are we talking about then? We're talking about the changes. I'm you're saying there are no changes. What we are talking about is something different. Is that we, when we met two years ago and we started warm, it's about uh, we were like, I mean, I was only twenty years experience. <laughs> Some of you a bit more, you know. But, uh, and uh, I think the idea was. Uh, uh, get people together. We, I mean, we all noticed we were so interested in some university project, artist project, Abu Nadara, other people, you know. Uh, I think we are not sure we are so useful. Uh, one reporter, mm. one newspaper, the media, you know. It's interesting to be together. It's interesting. Well, to, Sh Sharif has it, said. It, it's, it's a way, you know, to fight for the truth or yeah. to, I mean, I don't think But Sharif said you're doing a crap words, job. You know, he, s he said, Lamont, he said basically the mainstream media is not doing the job on Syria. Is that fair? I agree. 
is fair. So Le Monde isn't doing the job. I know, look, I'm not going for Le Monde. I think Le Monde's fantastic. But I'm just We are saying, doing our best. But, so, we, but we haven't got yeah. better then. Because we are doing our best. Yeah. But the idea was, you know, let's, let's gather, let's think together about how to fight for, you know, I don't, want, I don't like to say to fight for the truth because it's a big mm. word, it's a bit... But that's the idea, you know, it's, I mean, to try to do our best, we, we, you know, Sheriff is doing his films, we do our reporting, photography, your mm. film, you know. But let's try to do together something, you know, with archives and production yeah, yeah, yeah. together, but try to do our best, you know, a bit more. No, it does, it's, it sounds like what you're proposing on Warm, which we're very supportive of, is certainly trying to address some of these ills. But, Patrick, can I talk to you on, on this? Because uh, you're, you've been doing this longer than the rest of us. Um, how do you think, how has technology changed the way you work? Uh, is technology that's changed war journalism, or is it not technology? What's changed what we do? Well, technology makes it easier yeah. to work. I mean, there's a film coming every week. It would have been very difficult before. Yeah. You would have to find a horse, a donkey, or whatever to yeah. go get the films out. You have this fast mm. uh, information that makes that you have the people from the country who are the first report which I think is great. Some reporters say it's killing the job. Who cares? First of all, it's not a job. It's a way of, of doing things that we're doing. And we're, I think we're part of a big group. Mm. I'm not working alone. I'm working with him. I'm working with the people. In, mm. Well, I didn't go to Syria. But if I did, you have those people who are making films. I see their films. And when I see them with their phones, you know, going like this in the crowd, it's like somebody calling me saying, can you please come and help us? It makes me even more eager to come. And when I get my films out, if I can get them out, or my photos, I'm working for a team. You have after other people who are going to go on. And tonight, we're still working. We're talking, we're going to talk about... Not Syria getting paid, again. though. Pardon? Not getting paid. Well, that's what else is new. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings me on to freelancing. Paul, uh, of the people you teach... How many are ending up as freelancers and how many are going into the industry? Uh, well, I mean, when you say industry, I mean, very few, there are very few staff jobs in, yeah. in almost anything now. I mean, certainly within photography, there are almost yeah. none except for maybe the wire services. Um, actually, quite, in quite and this is probably going to sound in, our, in the context of today's um, discussion slightly odd, but actually most of them don't want to be war reporters, which I'm actually quite, quite happy good. about. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, what I do think is important, and I think this is where the freelancers have paid a very important role historically and, and continues to so, yeah. is this sense that um, there's, always, there's a very strange kind of um, tension at the heart of what we do because you're on the one level trying to do the stories that you care about, that you think are mm. important, that mean something, but you're also trying to make a living out of it. Mm. So there's a kind of conflict between the commercial aspect of what you do and the journalistic or the ethical aspect. What that actually does, though, is it drives you to go and find stories that are not told, that are, that are maybe going to sell because they're unique, they're original, mm. they're different, they, are, they haven't been seen before. Mm. So what you effectively get is the industry creating a network of, of witnesses, if you like, who are going out, almost like investigative journalists, digging out stories, trying to find a new angle on something, trying to find a new approach on something. And I think what Patrick said about it, the, collective, the collective nature of that we don't consciously think of ourselves mm. as, a, as a collective community, but I think actually that's what we are. And we're digging away, and this mm. is journalists, this is freelance photographers, freelance reporters, freelance filmmakers, creating this kind of network or map of information. Mm. It's then up to the audiences to engage with that and try and make sense of it and find. I think what's really interesting about the, the technology is that what it's changed in many ways, I think, is the, the power relationships in the industry. Uh, you know, when I was working predominantly, the person that paid you was the person that published the work that you did. So, you know, you work for The Guardian, The Guardian publishes your work, and that's who, who pays you. Nowadays, it's much more fluid than that. You know, you've got people like Marcus Bleasdale, for example, working in Congo. He's, he's making his money from grants and foundations and NGOs that are interested in the issues he's photographing. The work's being published, but actually the amount we're getting paid these days for that is, is so small it's almost not worth it. But what it does give is a shop window to the world. It promotes the work. It's a great kind of... Um, space to, for the work to be disseminated from. But the actual income that he's generating to be able to further his projects is coming from another source, because that source wants yeah. that story to be told. And technology is allowing us to distribute that in a much more level playing field. You can basically be your own media but, distribution. But, but so it's enabling fr more freelancers. I mean, I'm going to open it up to, the, uh, to, to our audience very soon. I just wanted to come back. 
Sharif is doing his job with his team because he feels that the story in Syria isn't being reported properly. I think we'd all agree that it, it isn't. It's a problem, and that's why you're engaged um, to try to do something about it with Warm. Um, but I want to, you know, why is that? I mean, uh, um, building on the freelance thing, uh, most, probably 80, 90 percent of the people covering the uh, free Syria side, the, the, the insurgent side in Syria, are freelance. Those people coming from, from Europe and America, they're freelance. They're not working for, directly for news, news organizations. They're not given a salary. Um, and, and yet it's failing. Um, and, and is this because the news industry isn't doing it? Is it because it's too dangerous? What, what is going wrong? Why is Shreve able to tell us that <clears throat> the Western media is not covering the story properly? I should uh, uh, go on, Remy. I should say who I'm directing my question no, to. I don't know. I don't, I don't fully agree. I mean, you don't agree. Okay. What? I mean, the first proofs of the use of chemical weapons were was brought by my newspaper, Le Monde, and it was not me. So I can. Was it a freelance or it? was it somebody? No, 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 no. It was no, a staffer. I mean, yeah. And then, uh, I mean, recently Anthony yeah, yeah, was for yeah. the Times, and it was you know, yeah, he, he two was freelance, the first one to spend two, two freelancers days in being killed quite, quite since yeah, you know yeah. a long time. So, I mean, uh, I mean, I think at the beginning there were a lot of freelancers because it was a little bit more open. Now I think the situation is so dangerous, and a lot of companies it's have said like they won't support so freelancers. Mm. I mean, it's we're too we're, dangerous. Yeah, when we were. Yuvan, Paul, me, when we were in Boston 20 years ago, it was 80% freelancers. We were freelancers because when it becomes so violent, you know, uh, media organizations don't send, don't send so much of their stuff to people. We were all freelancers. Same in Syria. But, but I mean, the main, I think, BBC, yeah. Le Monde, The Times, whoever, they are still going there. You know. I, want try. To, I want to open it up to the audience to ask questions. So um, please put your hands up. For your questions. Ah, we've got one. Please, yeah, wait for, if you can introduce yourself and. Uh, hello, I'm Julia um, from Holland. I was wondering how much you think um, the artistic way of um, uh, representing the news uh, will help make the news more interesting or accessible. Who, who are you directing your question to? Uh, uh, to um, one of the individuals, or, or should we just sheriff? Maybe yes. No, no uh, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not. Uh, uh, what we are doing is not to represent news in artistic way. We are filmmakers. We are not uh, journalists. We are not reporters. So we don't have to tell the truth. My job is to uh, to make you ask yourself questions about what is happening in Syria and to, to give you the desire to go on and look for information. Uh, my job is to represent uh, what is happening, uh, not as a war in Syria. We have a revolution which is failing now which is turning into war because uh, nobody help us. Okay, so my job is to, to, to build a new image of this reality and make room uh, in this image to imagination, questions, mm -hmm. it's all. Well, and that's a really important point, the idea of the imagination is very significant. I mean, I think within photography, for example, there's been a lot of response to um, trying to think about conflicts without going to the front line during the fighting itself. So there's a whole genre called aftermath photography, for example, people like Simon Norfolk who've made bodies of work where they've gone after the fighting's finished, but they're looking at the ruins and the destruction, and they're presenting that in a gallery context because it's just giving you a different perspective on, on the news. It's, it's perhaps a more thoughtful perspective uh, where you're inviting the audience to come in, the, the images are often quite beautiful, you know, graphically, visually quite beautiful, and then you're looking at it and you're realizing actually these are, you know, destroyed buildings and so on. And it, it's beginning to work in a more metaphorical, more symbolic way. And it's just another level of engagement with the, the issues that we've got. And we've actually, Kai Weidenhofer, who's at the back there, has done a fantastic project about barriers and walls, all these, these parts around the world where there are physical walls between communities, so in, in the West Bank, in, in Palestine in, uh, in um, Belfast and so on. And he's just done an amazing exhibition in 
called Wall on Wall, where he, he puts these giant billboard-sized posters of the walls onto other walls in other country, cities around the world, in places like Berlin and so on. So it's a way of kind of making an intervention outside of the mainstream media into people's consciousness, really. And I and think that's where the artistic approach, or more what you might call artistic approach, can be very, maybe, very effective. Maybe to answer your question, also a good example is Patrick, after 45 five years, a few years ago, uh, of war reporting, did a project in Paris called Gary C. Oh, yeah, that works. And, uh, and, and in, it's, today in Paris is, is, is more famous for Gary C than for 45 years of reporting. Yeah, which is just only like artistic, saying, you know, artistic project. We still have Hollande as a president and the no, war is still going on in Syria and this. And it's like normal life. No, but like explain Mamba, what you know. And explain then, and then what suddenly I said, okay, I'm going to put a picture of the Chechens on the, the Ark of Triumph. Mm -hmm. And I did it with a very good graphist. And the picture was like huge. And when they went to the expo, the people go, wow, what happened? I said, you didn't listen to the radio this morning? The, the Chechens are in Paris now. <laughs> and, and suddenly I said, but it's fake. And they said, ah. It's okay. So I said, oh, you mean it's okay when it's in Chechen, yeah, but it's not okay when it's in Paris. You have to be careful, you know, and plus that if you're not careful, first of all, it made the people feel like they were Chechen for two seconds. And, and second, just give them a warning, you know, the peace is not a natural, I don't think it's natural peace, war is. Uh, so you have to keep entertaining peace to keep it. Otherwise people will fight, you know, very easily. So you just, you know, to fight against war, you have to show the war, show the people what's happening. And, you know, sometimes when I go back from a story, I saw some uh, couple uh, crossing the road on the Champs-Élysées, and suddenly they, they crushed, and they held each other, and they ran. I thought, I said, hmm, there must be a sniper somewhere. It was just an idiot with a car trying to not run them over. And I said, Paris is going down the drain. People have no more civism anymore. They're trying to kill people with cars. They don't know that that looks like a war scene, and one day it'll be real if it goes on. So I used an artist to put the two things together. So art is part of telling the story, of course. I made a film on Iraq. It was called Iraq, Ira Iraq Resistance Artiste de Kalashnikov, it was called. And I had the war was t told uh, on that film by a poet, a writer, a sculptor, and a painter. I didn't do the patrols with the Americans and anything. The sculptor made a, a, a face of an American soldier, very nice, with glasses, and he made eight faces. And after the years, he had like, it was changing and becoming a monster, because that was his vision of the American coming to help them and suddenly changing things. He told the story better than any picture, and it came from the inside. And what's great with what's happening is also not only the artists, but the people, that, what we call citoyen uh, journalists, is they're starting by telling their own story. And then we, our, our, our job is to relay them, help them, uh, put them their stories on the wall, show the films, talk about it, because they're, they're asking us for our help, you know. And that's also part of it. It's not only going to the place, but meeting the people. We're going halfway. They're coming out now because they can, because of the technology. They can, they can send us a film from the desert. I mean, I think Patrick is absolutely right that it's not about entertainment, but it can be about the idea of spectacle, and it can be about the idea of using almost the kind of approaches of things like advertising to challenge people's expectations of what they see. So there's a really interesting group of young French photographers at the moment who are build, putting posters up, aren't they, large, large size posters of images from Congo and Syria and so on, just on the street in, in Paris. I made an another... expo in the countryside, and the guy who, was, who really wanted to talk about, uh, it, it was the war in Lebanon, uh, we took pictures and we stuck them on cows. <laughs> mm. was no yeah. But you don't this have the same the planning restrictions we have. Well, there's another very pictures. interesting project in Pakistan, so, you know, which is anything um, is possible. You know? Where they've made this enormous f uh, image of a child's face. I mean, it's vast. It's like you know, f 70 square meters, and put it on the roof of a building. So that the drone operators in the States, when they're flying over looking for targets to attack, see will it. see this giant defenseless child and it'll make them think. Oh shit! What am I doing? So it's a kind of artistic uh, in, in artistic. intervention into the whole idea well, of satellite you, you technology. Don't, you don't see journalism on public buildings in this country because of the planning restrictions don't allow for it. It's rather difficult. But anyway, I, I do like. I think we all like 
the way you do that in France, um, it's much better. Um, but we, I mean, Tom Stoddart, for example, had a very successful open air exhibition outside City Hall in that, in that plaza, and something like half a million people saw it because there's so wow. much so traffic, traffic, so much through throughput yeah. there. So I mean, we can make these kind of interventions. Question, yes. Um, I want to say to Sherif. It's working. Yeah. It's working. Uh, I want to say to Sherif that he's not doing the films fair uh, by saying that they're just uh, they're, they're making films and not telling the news because I I spent my entire life in Syria and people find it very hard to believe that I had my entire education in military clothing and learned how to use a Kalashnikov at 13 in school. And uh, one day I saw a two minutes film by Abu Nadara about how we were. Uh, brought up in school, and I think it made all the sense, it made all the um, chronology of events of the revolution and what happened after, uh, it made sense to me and to everybody I was trying to explain to them and I failed. So it's more of keeping our legacy and doing your responsibility as intellectuals uh, the best when everybody, when everything else is being decided by angry men with guns and attitudes. Um, what I want to ask is how can we in this room and people who we can reach through the people in this room help uh, keep Abu Nadara going. I know it's hard and I know it's voluntary and uh, every day I, I'm worried that one day people like you will not be able to continue. How can we make sure you continue? Shukran, Leila, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's our main, uh, our main uh, occupation. We, we, we have to, to find uh, means to, to go on. Uh, we need to, to make a new balance uh, with medias. We, we need to tell TV, uh, media in general, we, we are here and we cannot uh, tell uh, your story as you like. So what we need is your support that people share our films and just uh, say that uh, we agree, we share, uh, we agree uh, that there's another way to show, to represent the reality. It's how we succeed to, to, to make this film with Arte TV, because uh, they were impressed by, uh, by, uh, uh, by the fact that we found our audience without uh, without uh, with, without the help of the medias, so it's helped us uh, uh, to 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 know that there there are uh, an audience and uh, which is following our our films. It it's just what we need. I mean, we cannot uh, ask you more. Just see our uh, watch our films and and uh, share uh, do you do you think um, do you want to ask people to screen those more in in schools in universities in in cultural event is this what you want is this the way you want to spread that, that? yes uh, uh, now I'm trying with my comrades to to go uh, to, to schools, especially to speak about uh, the flow of images, YouTube images, and how to deal with, with those images. You will see we, we try to, uh, to edit those images in a certain way. It's really a, a huge question, how to deal with this flow of images we receive all the day long. So, I think it's very important to, to go with our topic, with our preoccupation, with our Syrian uh, affairs to audience in London, in Paris, everywhere, and tell them, look, it's how we deal uh, with this flow of images and, and see what can you do, uh, uh, how can you identify with, with this work. And, Let's try to, uh, to, to, to,
to, to make some uh, uh, common uh, rules uh, and uh, I don't know if I am clear. Uh, so, uh, yes, we need to go to, to schools, we need to, to, to reach a, a general audience, universal audience. We don't, ha we don't want to, uh, to speak with people and ask their pity or their, you know, oh, poor people of Syria. It's, it's, it's really ridiculous. We, we need to, um, yes. <laughs> now we've, we've got time for two more questions. We're going to have to have the film quite soon. So if we can keep questions short and answers short, please, <laughs> over there. Uh, you said nothing changed in reporting 20 years, which is quite upsetting because when Patrick started probably what, around 1967, Six Days Wars, any news were better than, than no news. Now we are sifting through tens of thousands of videos and tweets and pieces of information that are unsifted, unorganized, unverified. Uh, we're not looking for the media to be the transmitter of news because it's transmitted now much better than it was 20 years ago. We're looking for you to be the verifier of what's true and what's false. And uh, you're getting, rather than expanding, it feels like the, new, the, the industry and the freelancers are becoming shorter and more concise and, and more like Twitter la, rather than dragging the, everything up to your uh, professional level, is it? No, I said nothing changed because one asked me out of technology issues. So I think the way we behave, you know, when we report, I mean, nothing changed. You know, we, we go to people, we listen to people, we try to check information, we try to, I mean, uh, I think the way Patrick or, uh, you know, and uh, the older guys in this room, John Swain, you know, and others, you know, reported from Vietnam and Cambodia didn't change. I mean, I, I, my way of reporting is still, of, of course, we have very different tools. We have very different technology around us. We have very different people around us. We have citizen journalism. We have artists with, or, or you know, various people with, uh, with uh, different tools. But the way we behave on the ground when we are reporting, you know, didn't change. I mean, it's, it's, it's very simple. The, it's the, very simple. It's, reporters. It's, it's very professional. We try to be very professional. You know, it's very simple. So that didn't change. The world changed. So we're not going to be taken over by drones, drones for journalism or anything? I think the media changed. You were talking <laughs> about the media. The media failed. But the reporters on the ground are trying. Yeah. But we're, we're facing two dangers. It's on the ground, we're used to that. And then when we come back, we have a fortress a very auto-satisfied people that don't really want to see our, our work. No, and we're like in between. Yeah. And for the technology, yeah, the technology changed. I don't know how to use it, for, so for me, <laughs> nothing changed. <laughs> you know, journalism no, is sadly, it's a business as well. It's not just a public but, you know, service. So, it's so like how we failed in Syria have to be. is that we didn't, we didn't intervene. We should have come immediately. <coughs> and that was really being coward. I mean, it's like we were talking about it on the train. <coughs> the British and the Americans had said, we're not going to send some arms to the French resistance in 1943 because they're communists. What would have happened then? You know, who cares? You know, send the guns and let the Syrians deal with their, help them. Or otherwise, shut up, you know. And always saying this red line, if they cross this red line, they crossed it a thousand times. And Le Monde did the story, and you are telling the story, and everybody tells the story. But that's the problem. Where, as reporters on the ground, as foot soldiers, we're doing what we can, which is small, but we're doing what we can. And it just doesn't get through. So artists, any way, like tonight, go on talking about it. By all means, we have to keep doing this. And maybe, you know, the nail will get in at one moment. I don't know. No. Maybe we'll have to shoot a few people. No. Question? <laughs> Hello, my name's Edward. Um, I've got degrees in English and qualifications in journalism, but um, everyone's right. Media has completely changed, and we're all feeling the pressure of not being able to get staff jobs and having to write freelance. And I have no idea how you guys got your, like, your starts, but you're obviously very experienced. 
how, how do we go about it today? Because these things need to be reported on. Do I just buy a ticket to a conflict zone and hope for the best? Or, I mean, where, where do we even begin now? Flight to Turkey, 400 euros. Drive to Syria. Nobody's going to say don't, 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 don't do it right now, not this way. <laughs> but soon. Nobody's going to send you. You just go. But that's you, always been the case. I mean, you, you know. need to get trained as well on safety and things like that. You see, but not, not, not only the job change, but they always also, because it goes both ways, you know, the information comes out fast, but it comes in fast too. So you have double danger. Your, your source is in danger because his face is going to come out like yeah. two hours later while you're still in the country with him and he could get killed. So many guys helped us and got killed uh, because they helped us. You know, you can't hide anymore. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, the news is being published instantly, which means everybody gets to see it instantly. I mean, Mike Camber... Even the told. fighters or the, the guys on the ground, their attitude changes because they know what we're doing. They know how they look. Before, they didn't know what a camera was. I could probably go to Syria without a camera and just borrow a camera from a guy. He has the same one as I have. He probably knows how to use it better. I mean, one of the problems I had in Libya is to not have a picture of a guy going like this. They were all going, you know, like, shit, you know, I want a real story. But there was too much media, too many photographers. I got a few pictures like this because I was fat. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was terrible. So you had really to go to the front, front line to get the people who were too busy to act and then get their, the information. But so, so you see, it's, it's very perverse, this immediate thing, of, uh, because it's both ways. They know what's in our, on our TV, even before I saw my own film. I mean, some Palestinians, you know, when I came back, and I said, did you see my film? They all had already a paper saying, well, the montage was so-and-so. <laughs> uh, the sound was not very good. I mean, you know, Scorecard. And one, and one guy had changed his hair because he thought he was ugly in the film. <laughs> And I hadn't even seen the film. <laughs> you know. So that has changed, but both ways. Even the army, like the American army, or that, they're being much more careful. But it doesn't, it's no use for them because now it's soldiers filming their own uh, things. You know? So they're trying to stop us, and it leaks from behind. So I think we should all you know, get together and say, OK, the information is going through all, all over the place. But I think there's too many reporters. I shouldn't say that, but there's, I mean, so many guys now that you, you don't know, you know, if the guy's acting or, or really talking to the... You, you, you have some pictures where you have ten photographers and two guys fighting, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be the contrary. <laughs> so maybe we should start fighting together. <laughs> On that note, the la last question, please. Yeah. Are you all pro intervention then? Like, I watch a lot of mainstream media. Dare I say to read the Times every day? I don't know if that should be that against me. I, you know, I read the article about the Times journalist that got shot in the ankle by and befriended. And, Andrew Lloyd, yeah. Right. And so, I'm your consumer of mainstream audi audience. I feel informed. Um, are you all pro intervention? I mean, is that what you are hoping pro to achieve? Pro intervention? Of course I was, yeah. Was. I don't know, uh, you know, I didn't cover it. Paul. Well, I think when you, as, as, as Patrick said, when you act on the global stage and you say this is a line and if you cross that line we will take action and then you don't, then the entire global political system starts to suffer because of that. And I think if, if countries are, you know, realize they can get away with gross human rights abuses, um, Incessantly, without some kind of in international sanction, then clearly that's that's a major problem. So, yeah. I think you have to be very careful with the frame. And when you say intervention, intervention that means what do you mean? You know, do you mean troops on the ground or I was not? Totally yeah. against, you know, occupation in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Yeah. yeah. But well, some, but some intervention like helping, you know, to take down the Taliban regime in 2001. I think after that NATO occupation was, was you know, a mistake yeah. because there was no war to fight and no need. I mean, you have to be very careful with that kind of, you know, uh, it's a long discussion. I mean, it's not yeah, but the tonight, Russians but are not being careful. They're helping Bashar, and Iran is helping Bashar. So but, what the fuck but, are we doing, you know? 
We're just going to look at it. You but didn't Syria, ask me. I thought, I, uh, forgive me, I assumed <laughs> your answer. <laughs> as for me, I think, uh, as a filmmaker, uh, you can protect people if you recognize their dignity. Uh, what we are trying to do is to represent the struggle between the society and the state. So if you see uh, uh, those people, if you recognize uh, that their, uh, uh, their struggle is, uh, is a universal one, you can pr protect them because uh, Assad couldn't kill them, couldn't tell you that they are all terrorists and Islamists. The problem is here. You can, uh, if, you, if you see these people, if you see that they, they look like you, you, you cannot accept that they are still uh, uh, killing by, by the Assad regime. Sherif, we're going to watch your film now. Could you briefly introduce it to us and explain what we're about to see? There will be some questions after the film. Uh, there's two ideas I, I want to, to, to under, underscore. We, we don't film what uh, uh, journalists uh, uh, like to film generally. We we go to the counter shots. Uh, we we go to people, and we try to represent anonymous people, uh, Syrian women and men who are fighting uh, in their everyday life, and we we try to translate this breakdown, this huge thing we call revolution, in a new form, a new format. Uh, so in this film, we try to, to, to translate our struggle, the struggle of the society, in uh, a new aesthetics. It's, it's all what I have to Excellent. say. Excellent. Well, if the panel can remove their microphones so they don't...